you get the Sunday email, you have all the details. Please, please, please look over that because we really don't try to put extra in that. I try to keep it limited to the things that are coming up and that are important. But we are not a boring church, are we? No. <laughs> we, we have so many things going on, but it's very exciting. And uh, we've got a Labor Day picnic coming up, and I have not sent the email out yet where you can sign up for what you're going to bring, but we are going to provide the hamburgers, the hot dogs, the drinks, the paper goods. We're going to have the barbecue grills out there right after church on Sunday of Labor Day weekend. Not Monday, but Sunday, so mark your calendars for that. Please sign up to bring stuff because that's what makes it really fun is we have lots of food. Then it's going to be fun. Uh, talking about food, if you look over here, we've got a new shelving unit that the Mennonite Church put up. And we asked for this because we kind of stocked up some food during COVID. And if we don't get that out pretty quick, it's going to be expired. So we're going to be starting to put food out here. So please take that food. Um, we want you to take that. Take it for yourself or take it for somebody that you know that needs some food. And then if you're out grocery shopping and you want to buy something extra that's not almost outdated, then you can put that on the shelf. So that's kind of why it's out there is we want to get food out while it's still good and, um, and just to help people. And so we don't know what the future looks like, but if you keep your ears open for people that are that in need, say, you know what, I'm going to take an extra case or an extra few cans, please do that. There's, but we'll be, that all four churches are going to be involved in that, as well as the senior citizens that meet here for some of their Silver Key lunches. So this will be an ongoing thing that's happening. Fuel Men, I just found out last night, you have been invited to the Rock Church Friday and Saturday of this coming weekend. Uh, and uh, Jim Nelson will send out more details, but you can also look at the rockchurch.org. They have all the announcement, but it's uh, like a men's advance. The, there will be breakfast and lunch provided. There is a cost, but if you're having difficulty with the finances, see Jim, and there's some discounts that we can get. But this is kind of an impromptu thing that they just put together for their men, and they want to invite us as a church, so that's an honor for you to be invited. Fuel Women, we are going to start up again our dinner uh, life group meetings coming the last Tuesday of September, so that's September 27th. So mark your calendar. We'll meet the same time that the men meet. One of us will meet upstairs, and one of us will meet downstairs, but we'll have our own time together. Pastor Jarrell and Rachel have put together Elitch Gardens, a fun event coming up on September 10th. So if you want to have some fun and just go out and scream and yell and roll, uh, ride roller coasters, the details are in your Sunday email. You can ask uh, Pastor Jarrell or Rachel about that too. And probably the biggest announcement that I have, if you saw your Sunday email, if not, I'm going to announce it here is that, you know, we have been praying for revival for quite some time here, haven't we? And we've encouraged a lot of us to go to the Mario Murillo Crusade, Tent Crusade, which was here. We had, there were fi about 5,000 people that attended that in Colorado Springs. There have been the Billion Soul Harvest was here. There's been some other things. So this week, I got a message from the pastor that we work with in India. And there's a very, very large church in Indri India that... Uh, we got connected with this pastor during COVID. He is a pastor of about 5,000 people. And if you know much about outreach in Indian churches, just because of the persecution and, and just the way things are set up there, most churches are about the size of our church. And it's very difficult because of the persecution and the fear that's involved with the, the radical Hindus and the, the Muslims that are there. And so, but this pastor is a pastor of a large church of 5,000 people in India. When on Easter... They actually get out in a, and they do a parade in Hyderabad where there's hundreds and maybe even thousands of Christians that go down the streets of India and they actually evangelize and pass out tracts on that Easter Sunday. So it's pretty powerful what this church is doing. They feed, they feed the poor. They go into the hospitals and pray for the sick. And so I was made aware of that the pastor there would like to come to Fuel Church. I'm like... What? I said, do you realize how, our, how small our church is? And he said he doesn't care. But he and Dan got connected during COVID, and Dan did a Zoom meeting, a couple Zoom meetings with him. And he says, I want to come here and honor Pastor Dan. I'm coming to the United States already because my children are going to college. I want to come to Field Church. So how, do, how many of you know? I'm not going to say no to that. I'm like, we're going to have Pastor PJ Stephen Paul at Field Church. So mark your calendar. Sunday, September 11th, he is going to be here. Now, 
what I promised is they said they're completely fine with them coming to a smaller church, but they would like me to make sure I'm advertising that, inviting people. So I need you to be here and invite somebody. You know, we've been praying for a revival here. I believe with all my heart God is sending a pastor all the way across the ocean from India to be at Field Church. God has heard our prayer. So I need you to be here on that Sunday, and I need you to invite absolutely everybody you know to be here. We've been praying for this church to be packed, standing room only, and I think this is going to be an awesome Sunday for that to happen. And Pastor Mike at the Rock Church says he is going to spread the word at his church to encourage some of his people to actually come here on that Sunday. So please make sure you're here on that Sunday. So on that note, we're going to show just a tiny, tiny part of a promo video that he sent. The rest, the link is in your Sunday email. I really want to encourage you to watch all of that because it just shows you how broad the ministry is and just, again, the honor of having this man who's really anointed of the Lord in evangelism and healing coming to our church, Field Church. P.J. Stephen Paul with his spirit and is using him mightily to save lakhs of people. From that day on, the Lord is holding his hand and leading him forward. It's a successful ongoing journey. All glory to God. In order to fulfill the great commission given by Jesus Christ, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Dr. P.J. Stephen Paul and Sister Shala Paul are playing their role in serving the Lord victoriously. God is using him to share the gospel to millions of people. By letting the light of Christ shine through his life, he is leading many into the salvation of our Lord. Our PG Stephen Paul ministry is advancing forward with many glorious twists, turns, and numerous memorable events. It's been a blessing to thousands, lakhs, and millions of families across the globe. The spirit-filled messages are changing and touching plenty of lives and strengthening them in the Lord. Few millions of people are being blessed so far. That's exciting. Man, <laughs> it's like the Indian Billy Graham's coming to Field Church. <laughs> Y'all excited about that? <laughs> yeah. Man, come with expectant hearts. Whew. Well, my name is Jarrell. If you don't know me, nice to meet y'all. I think I, sh I shook you guys' hands at the door. Thank you for being here. Uh, to our friends and family online, thank you for being here, joining us today. Thumbs up from the tech team. That's awesome. <laughs> so, today's, today's title I don't know if you've noticed a theme yet, but today's title is this. It's Journey to the Center. Uh, a week ago, I talked about our mission statement. A week before that, we, Pastor Maria talked about our vision statement. And today, today I get to talk to you about our core values. And uh, the title originally was Journey to the Center of Our Core Values, but I think that was a little long, so we cut it. And uh, if you are keeping up with what we're doing, last week's was Mission Impossible. It was a movie. This week is Journey to the Center. If you know that movie, um, yes, thank you. We'll try to keep on theme here. <laughs> but we're, today is Journey to the Center of Our Core Values. Core values are so important, guys. Um, it means something. It's, it's, it, it adds up to the whole being of, of what somebody believes in. And so we believe that it's important to, to talk about those things. I mean, we've been here for eight years now. Um, it's okay to, to cycle back and kind of look at our history, look at where we're going, and make sure that we're all one accord here, right? That you go, we're all on the same page pursuing Jesus together. So let's pray. Father, we, we give you this time. God, this is all for you. Lord, you brought us here today. God, would you open up our hearts and open up our ears to hear you. We thank you for your presence, God. We, we glorify you. We worship you. We praise you. And we just want to hear from you. 
We love you, Lord, with all that we are. Speak to us, Lord. Holy Spirit, minister to our hearts. God, we lay it all down before you. That you would fill us up, Lord God, that we may be able to pour out. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Do you guys have personal core values? Yeah. Yes. We all do, right? Things that you live by. Things that are a part of your genetic makeup. You know, we believe in that. This is who I am. This is how I do things. Whether they were created um, through personal experiences, passed down by family members or generations, or even created by circumstances and situations, right? Examples. Don't be friends with your exes. I just don't do that, right? Right? I don't know. Maybe we're different. I don't know. <laughs> All right, moving on. Um, don't jump into a pool for at least 30 minutes after eating, right? Don't do that. You're going to barf. Um, always pack snacks when traveling with kids. I am learning that. Uh, don't wear white after Labor Day. I don't know if that's a core value. Um, <laughs> never date your friend's sister. Snitches get stitches, right? Et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> core values are important. The definition of a core value is, is this. Core values are traits or qualities that are not just worthwhile, but they represent an individual's or organization's highest priorities. Deeply held beliefs and core fundamental driving forces. They are the heart of what people stand for. It's our roadmap. Core values mean something. You know, when Rachel and I came to Colorado, we, we came here with a purpose. We put our faith in Jesus. We we're called to, to be here to plant a church, you know? This was it. Called to leave home called to a journey that's, that's still going on today. And we, we haven't arrived yet. We're still on that journey. It's been nine years since we moved from California, 2013. I remember, I remember the beginning, you know, having a small team. We were praying together, worshiping, listening to the Lord, fasting, asking God to pour out on us. And he did. He came through. Fuel Church, our core values, it, it means something to me. It's more than just a pleasant reminder. It's more than just uh, a nice poster on the wall in my office. These core values, um, we, we wanted something different. We wanted to be church redefined. You might see that in, in some of our advertising on our website. That was our whole thing. How, do, how are you a church redefined? We had to look at our core values. How are we different? What is God telling us to do? When we came up with the core values after some time of prayer and fasting, this was, this was it. This is who we were called to be. This is what God put on our hearts. This is what happens when a bunch of misfits for Jesus get together and wholeheartedly pursue him. This was the foundation. This is what got us excited, right? These were the tools that were to be used to punch the devil in the mouth and see lasting transformation. This was our battle cry. This was sealed in our hearts. I'm not going to get through all of the <laughs> core values today. We have a baby dedication that I'm really excited for. So if I'm speaking fast, uh, forgive me. And come back next week so we can finish them off, okay? <laughs> but let's jump into it. And in no particular order, let's go. Um, this is the first one. We choose Jesus to be the center of our world. The center of our world. We ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? We seek first his kingdom and allow his word to guide us. We train, equip, and advance people toward an authentic, passionate, and effective relationship with Jesus. It's number one. And I have some scriptures to go with it. If you're taking notes, there are going to be a lot of scriptures today. 
But Galatians 2.20 says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus in the center of our world, ladies and gentlemen, is, is to say, this is not mine. This is not my world. I choose to let go. It's no longer about me, but it's about the life of Christ inside of me. Colossians 3, 17. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through him. And this is how we advance people toward an authentic, passionate, and effective relationship with Jesus. Scripture right here. We look to Jesus for all we do, and we give him thanks while we're doing it. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 simply says this, follow me as I follow Christ. This is a training ground. In order to train and equip, we need to be passionately pursuing Jesus ourselves as a church. As we follow Christ, we bring people with us. We take those around us and we move forward with Jesus. I love what Paul says there, follow me as I follow Christ. It's not about me. I'm, I'm following somebody else, you know. I'm going towards him and I'm bringing everybody around me with me. The second core value is we live and we make decisions by radical but secure faith. I love that. We live and make decisions by, radi by radical but secure faith. What is the Holy Spirit saying? At any time, we are ready to take a risk, to get creative, to move quickly as the Holy Spirit leads. Proverbs 3, 6 through 7 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. It's about being led, you guys. It's not about this 10-step decision-making process where we drag things through the ground. We're listening for the Holy Spirit. We desire the Holy Spirit. We're passionate about being led by the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it's quick. Sometimes we wait on the Lord, right? We wait on the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. John 16, 13 says, But when he, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, excuse me, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. These are promises that allow us to have radical and secure faith. Radical but secure faith. We're waiting on the Lord. We need him. That's how we make decisions here. It's not all honky-dory. It's not about what's the uh, greatest and latest. It's about what is the Holy Spirit talking to us? What is he saying to us? What's in the air? What's going around in our community? What's happening in this family right here? God, lead us. I like this one. We help people find health. Their gifts and talents and their purpose. It's pretty cool. We're about people, purpose, and transformation. Not programs, not budgets, not even a building or personalities. But we're about people and purpose. You'll, you'll hear it often. Transformation, transformation, transformation. We, we desire not to be the old us before Jesus. We desire to be the new. We desire to be the now. What is God doing now? 
And I love that this church isn't about a personality, isn't about a person up here preaching, but it's about the people, it's about the body. What is God doing inside of you? How can we develop that? How can we come around you and work with you, walk with you in your passions, in your troubles, in your condition, whatever you want to call it? Gosh, this church is about people. Romans 12, 6 through 8. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If one's gift is prophecy, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is giving, let him give generously. If it is leading, let him lead with diligence. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Like I said, it's about people here. Where do people fit? What are people's calling? It's not a popularity contest here at Fuel Church, but we're about each and every one of you, regardless of if you've been here for the last eight years or if it's day one. It's about people. And I was talking to Pastor Maria, something that she has come to know in her time here at Fuel through the years, is that God, you know, we, we all have different gifts, right? But God will give you gifts and he'll give you what you need when you need it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a gifted teacher. I'm a gifted preacher. I'm a gifted intercessor. But when God is using you, when God has put you in a place for a divine appointment at a divine time to do something, God will be with you and he'll give you gifts that, that you had no idea you had inside of you, that you were able to do. When the Holy Spirit comes alive and you're leaning on him and not on your own understanding, God can do some amazing things, can he not? Amen. And we've seen that here at Field Church. I mean, I've seen it on the mission field. I've seen the most meek little girl who, who was going like this the whole mission trip come alive and sharing her testimony, praying for people, something that no one ever expected out of her. But in that moment, in that time, she said, yes, God, use me, and he did. Isn't that amazing? Amen. We're about people here. And one talks about helping people find their health. We want people to find health here as well, spiritually, physically, and emotionally. This is a safe place. This is a safe place to be family. There's another um, core value that talks about family being messy, and I'll talk about that next week. But when it comes to finding health, sometimes it's messy. Sometimes it's difficult. It's a process to walk through. Here at Field Church, we, we want to be there for you uh, through it. You know, this isn't just a Sunday event. Field Church is a Monday through Sunday event. And we might not get to hang out every day, <laughs> but we're here for one another. I, I can't tell you um, how many phone calls I get during the week, how many text messages I send out, checking up on people, hearing praise reports. Uh, I love it. I'm all for it. And I know it's not just the leadership thing. Yeah, we have people in leadership roles here, but we're a family. You, you can reach out and touch somebody, ask them how they're doing, now you're on a journey. <laughs> now you're on a ride because we're about people here. This next um, core value is going to lead me into um, the part of the message that, that God has really been speaking to me this week. And this core value says this. We are all broken in need of a Savior to heal and transform us. We are all broken and need of a savior to heal and transform us. We are all on a journey from brokenness to healing. We are real and authentic, but sensitive to triggers and brokenness 
of one another in the midst of our healing process. How you say something here at Field Church is just as important as what you say. You ever hear people say, to be honest, and say something kind of kind of hurtful, kind of rude? You ever hear people say, well, I'm just being honest here, blah, 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 blah. Or we've heard people say, I'm a realist, therefore, X, Y, and Z. I want us to be careful with those statements. Sometimes when we say, to be honest, and it's filled with a comment that, that you're trying to say and you're not considering the other person, it kind of shows that you're incapable of listening. Because people are going through things. People are broken. People have unresolved things in their lives that they're struggling with, searching. And praise God that they're here. (laughs) Praise God that we're here to be able to go through these things to be able to to have an open space, to talk in men's group, to have dialogue, to go to the women's group and share and share and share. It's an open book here at Fuel Church, and I love that. And you might be in a place where you're not ready to share. That's okay. But know that when you're ready and when you need somebody, Fuel Church is here, the people here are for you. Turn with me to Romans 3.23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're still in process. None of us have arrived. We're all on an equal playing field, all growing, all maturing. Psalms 34.18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to to the Father except through me. We are a broken people. We need a way, right? We need a truth. We need life. And that's Jesus. This is his house. He dwells here. He's the center of our world. We go to him in our brokenness, for our brokenness. And as I was praying, you guys, and thinking, how do I, how do I bring core values and, and put a message behind it and not just say scripture and be done? And God kept on bringing this, this image of coals, 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 all week. I'm like, what does that mean? And as I, as I dove in, as I was in my study, coals and its meaning in the Bible is spread through the Old Testament and the New Testament. The symbolism of coals in the Bible is used for judgment, for purification, and also in terms relating to God's power, God's fire, Right? I couldn't, I couldn't shake it. First thing I thought about was, uh, was Christmas, <laughs> right? And if you know me, I, I have a storied history with Christmas. Sometimes I wish Santa would have gave me coal on Christmas, so then at least I would have known what side of the list I was on. But uh, he never did, so I never knew. Anyway, <laughs> um, there's so m- many different things that I could talk about regarding coal. So many different angles that we can go through today. But the one I want to focus on, um, there's two of them. Turn with me to Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. And I'm just going to read this for you guys. Follow along with me, and then we'll break it down. In the first year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were a seraphim, each with six wings. 
With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4, at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See this, touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. In chapter 6, we see Isaiah on his commissioning day. He had this vision, and after this, he was used of the Lord. Verse 1 said, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. So there were seraphim where were there, all with their splendor, crying out, holy, holy, holy. The number three is significant in here. In Hebrew, to say holy twice was to describe someone as most holy. So to say it three times intensifies the idea of the highest level of holiness. Isn't that amazing? Followed by the whole earth is full of his glory. There's no one like God. There's no one like him. At this point, this is what Isaiah was seeing. Imagine that. Isaiah said that he was ruined. He thought he was done. He recognized that he wasn't worthy to be in the presence of the Lord. He recognized that his sin and his wickedness, he was pretty sure that he was going to die. And then Isaiah's life changed when he was touched by the burning coal of God's altar. Notice that the fire of the Lord touched Isaiah at the exact point of his confession. For I am a man of unclean lips, he says. For I live among a people with unclean lips. The burning coal was applied to his lips. What happened? He was transformed and anointed to speak the word of the Lord. Confession is crucial. It's a crucial part if we desire to go on an intimate journey with God. This is a callback from last Sunday. We desire to be intimate with the Lord, right? We know intimacy with the Lord affects everything that we do. According to the scripture, confession leads to intimacy as well. We need God to take the burning coal of his love and touch us at every point of our brokenness. Can I repeat that? We need God to take the burning coal of his love and touch us at every point of our brokenness. We need to be transformed into vessels that carry his fire. Amen? Isaiah left that temple a changed man. It was his dying day, quote unquote. It was like a log thrown into a bonfire, if you can imagine that. A huge bonfire consumed by God's fire, which now he carries with him. He carries that. He was used to call on God's people to repent and to return to him. That's how coals were used in this vivid example in the Old Testament. Now let's turn to Luke 24, 13 through 30. This is kind of a lot, but it's important that we go through it um, to get to our point here. And this is the road to Emmaus. You guys ever open up your Bible and you're reading and you're like, did I miss this? You know, you, you've read this before. You know this. And it's like brand new. And it's like, how in the world did I, 
did I not see this? You know, weird. But I was reading Luke 24, and this amazed me. And I feel like it, it gets thrown into the back because, you know, this is at the point where, where Jesus died on the cross, his tomb is empty, he ascended into heaven, um, everybody's all wilding out, you know, what's going on, where's Jesus, you know? But let's get into it. Luke 24, verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I don't know how that happens. It doesn't explain here. That's okay. Let's keep going. He asked them, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named uh, Cleopas, Cleopas asked him, are you, the one, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Can you imagine saying that to Jesus? <laughs> this guy. Um, and then Jesus, right, being so coy. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to imagine what, what Jesus' posture is. In verse 19, he goes, what things? <laughs> about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, speaking right to him. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief, high, the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they, didn't, they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companion went to the tomb and found it. Found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He had said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter, in, enter his glory? And beginning with Moses, check this out, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus, Jesus took this opportunity to teach. He taught them, starting with Moses and all the prophets before Jesus. That's amazing, Right? Can you imagine hearing from Jesus himself prophecy, what's to come, what happened? I don't know. That boggles my mind. <laughs> Verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scripture to us? Y'all remember ever reading that? <laughs> it's amazing, right? Things that transpired. How did these two not know? And also make fun of Jesus at the same time. He said, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know? They basically called Jesus a tourist here. And then the part when Jesus rebukes these two and starts teaching them. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. These guys are lucky, and they're clueless at the same time. 
What a blessing, though. God is good like that, isn't he? Even after that, the two still didn't know, had no idea. So they invited Jesus in, and they invited him in. And they invited him in when it said that it looked like Jesus was going to continue on. They stopped him, and they urged him to come and stay with him. I want you to take note what happens here. This is very significant. If I can have the worship team come up. In verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and broke it. And he began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. Then he disappeared from their sight. Verse 32 they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened up the scripture to us? The reason their hearts were burning was because someone was taking up residence with them. Someone was talking with them. Someone was journeying with them. Someone was leading them in communion. Their hearts burned Within, because the spirit of revelation opened their eyes to understand. With their spiritual eyes open, they knew. They knew him. They knew who Jesus was in the breaking of the bread. What this is saying is that they met him in communion. When he vanished from their sights, they were left with the fire of God. They were left with living coals of fire in their hearts. We are called to be carriers of the fire. The Lord is looking to see if we have that fire within us. Are we still burning? Are we still passionate? Has the fire gone out? We need God to touch us with the burning coal like Isaiah. We need to look at communion and ask ourselves, do I leave the table with a burning heart? Do I recognize Jesus here in this place? Final scripture, Leviticus 6.13. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. Do you guys see how this connects? Let me read that again. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. He's coming to see if on the altar of your life, if that fire is still burning. Let's pray for that. Let's pray for that fire to start. Let's pray for that fire to grow. If it needs to be fueled and that it keeps burning. Amen? There's these coals. Coals, coals, coals. That's what God is speaking to me. And I think about Isaiah. I think about how I touched his lips and he was changed. I think about how Jesus visited these two and how they said it was like our hearts were burning. It was burning within us. Then he broke bread and then he left. And they knew exactly what they needed to do. They, they went out and they, they told the rest of the disciples, we were with Jesus. Things changed after that burning happens in their hearts. Things change when we become passionate for the Lord. Is that where you're at? And that's not a judgment call. That's not here to condemn. condemn. That's a call to action. We have these core values for a reason. It's to set us up. It's to get us ready. It's to move forward. It's for everyone. And not to conform you to who we are, but it's to conform us to who Jesus is, right? That's who we're all striving for. That's what we desire. We have questions. We have concerns. 
We need direction. We're asking Jesus for all these things. Today, let's ask him. Let's ask him. Is our heart still fired up for you? Have you left us with your fire? Did, did you give us your fire and did I run, am I running with it? Or have I just left it to the side and continued on? I want you guys to stand with me. We're going to go into communion. Jesus went into, this guy, into these two disciples and into their house still not knowing who he was, and he broke bread with them. This, this scripture isn't often quoted for communion, but I love it because it makes so much sense that when we take communion, we recognize him. We, we come to the table, and we recognize him, and he leaves us with a burning heart after we partake. It's not just the take and go, your sins are forgiven, hallelujah. No. We take of communion, and we're one with the Lord. We take communion to celebrate. We take communion to remember. Excuse me, fly. So let's do that together, amen? I want you guys to go ahead and, and come up here. Take of the elements. If you're watching online, do that at your own leisure. And then let's stay right here. Let's take the elements together, and then I'll pray and release us into the baby dedication. Thank you so much for tuning in to the original Fuel Church YouTube and being a part of what we're doing here at Fuel. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you enjoyed what you heard today, share it with a friend. And if you'd like to support Fuel and Fuel International, information to do so will be in the description below. Have an awesome day. Look forward to seeing you soon.